fully evolved modern human beings have been living in what we now call Virginia for many thousands of years. The Cactus Hill site south of present-day Richmond, one of the oldest archaeological sites in the Americas, is believed to have been occupied by human beings as much as 20,000 years ago. Many archaeologists now believe the eastern coastal plain of what is now the United States was settled by explorers from Europe traveling by boats along glacial coastlines during the last ice age. Over thousands of years in the Americas, human beings developed into distinct cultural and linguistic tribal groups. At least three primary linguistic groups settled in what is now Virginia. The cultural geography and settlement patterns followed along distinct geological formations, with the Iroquoian speaking Cherokee along the Ridge Valley systems of the Appalachian Plateau to the west, the Siouan speaking Tutelo, Saponi, Akonichi along the Roanoke River as it courses through the Blue Ridge and across the Piedmont, and the Monacan and Manahoic tribes in the central and southern Piedmont between the mountains and the fall line, now central Virginia. Below the fall line of the rivers, the principal federation of tribes was the Algonquin Powhatan, with well over 30 tribes sprinkled throughout the coastal plain, up and down the rivers and along the eastern shore. The English were playing catch-up with other Europeans as they made efforts to explore and settle the Americas. By the time Jamestown was founded in the spring of 1607, the English had already been preceded by the Portuguese, the French, and the Norsemen of Scandinavia. Even the Spanish had already had a Christian mission in what is now Virginia as early as 1570, decades before Jamestown. John Smith's 1612 map of Virginia was a seminal achievement of the era, offering the most comprehensive account of the settlement patterns of various indigenous people in the region, including for the first time named village sites. Smith's 1612 map included specific descriptions of the location of the Monacans in the central Virginia Piedmont, what is now Albemarle County. The map identified primary Monacan village sites for the first time, including Rosawick and Manasukapanaw. Scholars believe the Monacan people and their descendants migrated out of the region prior to English settlement in the early 1700s, but they did not disappear altogether, and their historic occupation of the land was noted by contemporary observers. Even Thomas Jefferson wrote about seeing the native peoples on occasion near Monticello. He even led an excavation of an indigenous burial mound in 1783 and published the results. That study is noteworthy for having been the first scientific archaeological investigation in the Americas. Here are students and their teacher at the Bear Mountain Indian Mission School on the Monacan settlement near Bear Mountain in Amherst County, 1914. Amateur photographer and educational reformer Henry Jackson Davis took this photo as well as approximately 6,000 others in the early 20th century to document the poor conditions of rural schools in marginalized African American and Native American communities. Despite the efforts of long-standing Jim Crow era legislation that was aimed at denying their existence, the Monacan people managed to preserve their identity and culture. They were at last officially recognized as a tribal nation by the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1989, but not by the U.S. government until 2018. In 1645, English colonists finally established a permanent settlement at the falls of the James River, its highest navigable point, Fort Charles which became a bustling trading post for furs, hides, and tobacco. William Byrd II later founded the town of Richmond on this site in 1742. In 1646, Fort Henry was established at the falls of the Appomattox River, later the site of Petersburg. And in 1676, 
a fort was established at the falls of the Rappahannock River, later Fredericksburg. By 1730, extensive land grants in the Shenandoah Valley were given to Quaker families in Pennsylvania to encourage settlement, both for economic reasons as well as to provide a buffer to the native Indian population in the West, which would in turn encourage further settlement in the Piedmont. In 1731, there were even more land grants made in the valley to Scots-Irish and German settlers from the north. These early European settlers followed the Great Wagon Road, moving south up the valley into Virginia, following along what is now approximately Route 11. In the 1730s, land patents were recorded in the Piedmont region of what is now Albemarle County, as the first of the land speculators and settlers moved in from predominantly affluent areas to the east and northeast. Farmers also migrated over the Blue Ridge, down the valley to the west. These early European families included Fry, Cabell, Merriweather, Carr, Carter, Epps, Howard, Hudson, and Lewis. In 1737, Michael Woods moved east through the mountains, now called Woods Gap, and settled what is now western Albemarle County. And in 1741, Peter Jefferson arrived from the east, having been born near Richmond, and settled his growing family along the Ravana River on a farm he called Shadwell. 18th century European settlers traveled along the Mountain Road, later called the Three Notched Road or Three Chopped Road, which led from Richmond across the central Virginia Piedmont to three distinct passes through the Blue Ridge and up into the Shenandoah Valley. Charlottesville's downtown mall, West Main Street, Ivy Road, and Route 250 all follow along that same colonial roadway today. On September 4, 1744, the Colonial General Assembly chartered the County of Albemarle, named for Virginia's then royal governor, Willem Ann Van Keppel, the second Earl of Albemarle. The county seat, location of the first courthouse and jail facility, were just west of present-day Scottsville. Albemarle is the English pronunciation of Omarle, a county in northwestern Normandy. A Count of Omal had come with William the Conqueror to England in 1066. Lord Albemarle's godmother was Queen Anne, for whom the Ravana River is named the River Anne. Surveyors Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson completed their landmark map of Virginia in 1751. It was the first of its kind to show the far western parts of the colony, English towns and home sites, as well as the early colonial road network. Peter's son Thomas had been born at Shadwell on April 13, 1743. Albemarle County was downsized in 1761, and the following year, December 23, 1762, a more centralized location was chartered as the site for a new courthouse. Conveniently laid out on either side of the three-notched road, the new county seat of Albemarle was named for King George III's new bride, Sophia Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz henceforth known as Charlottetown or Charlottesville. This is the earliest known map of the town of Charlottesville, about 1773. It was the result of a land survey ordered by Thomas Jefferson, and it shows the grid pattern of the new town on a ridge west of the Ravana River. The town included 56 half-acre lots and a public square on the northern outskirts for a courthouse. During the Revolutionary War, thousands of British and Hessian or German soldiers were captured after the battles of Saratoga in 1777 Initially, they were kept in Massachusetts, but the soldiers were eventually force-marched south to Albemarle County, Virginia, arriving in January of 1779. These prisoners of war built huts and barracks to house themselves, and by the spring of that year, their camp had become something of a self-contained village with gardens, a coffee house, and even a theater or comedy house. 
the wagon trail from Charlottesville through the woods and fields out to their prisoner of war camp was called the Barracks Road, as it still is to this day. The revolutionary Virginia government retreated to Charlottesville during the war. British Colonel Bannister Tarleton and his 180 dragoons and 70 cavalrymen were ordered to go after them. Fortunately, Charlottesville's John Jack Jewett Jr. spotted them on the march and raced ahead of them during the night. It was June 4, 1741. He warned then-Governor Thomas Jefferson and the members of the legislature. Celebrated as the South Paul Revere, Jewett's heroic ride was later officially recognized by the Virginia General Assembly. Thomas Jefferson's vision for a truly modern university was finally realized in January of 1819 when the Virginia General Assembly granted him the charter for the University of Virginia. Classes started on Monday morning, March 7th, 1825. Edgar Allan Poe was a student that first year, but only for about 10 months before his stepfather pulled him out of the school for having racked up a sizable gambling debt playing cards with his fellow students. Thomas Jefferson passed away at Monticello on July 4th, 1826. From August of 1814 comes this, the very first sketch that Thomas Jefferson ever made of what would eventually become the University of Virginia. As first envisioned, the pavilions were much smaller and they all looked identical. There was no rotunda, nor any ranges in the original plan. The Louisa Railroad Company was founded in 1836, later known as the Virginia Central, and ultimately the Chesapeake and Ohio. It began its expansion west through Albemarle from Gordonsville. Hundreds of Irish immigrants and their families settled in central Virginia to work on building the rail lines. They christened a part of town in Charlottesville, Vinegar Hill, after the famed Irish Battle of Vinegar Hill against the British in 1798. On June 27, 1850, the first train arrived in Charlottesville and it reached the Meacham's River by 1852. On Christmas Day, 1856, under the leadership of French engineer Claudius Crozet, the Blue Ridge Tunnel was holed through. It was only six inches off perfect alignment. By 1860, the north-south tracks were also in and trains running between Charlottesville and Lynchburg as part of the new Orange and Alexandria line. As part of moving supplies for World War II, the CNO replaced Crozet's historic tunnel with a new one. Their alignment was four feet off. Despite the fact that most of the Civil War was fought in Virginia, the Charlottesville area saw very little actual combat. Aside from a skirmish north of town at what is now the Rio Hill Shopping Center on Route 29 North, Charlottesville and Albemarle were spared much of the horrors of battle that had devastated much of the rest of Virginia. With a skilled medical faculty at the university and convenient east-west, north-south rail lines intersecting nearby, wounded Confederate and even Union soldiers were rushed to Charlottesville for care by the tens of thousands throughout the Civil War. Any available public and private buildings were used to treat the soldiers, including classrooms and dormitories at the University of Virginia, all of which were collectively referred to as the Charlottesville General Hospital. On March 3, 1865, General George Armstrong Custer led Union troops into Albemarle County and Charlottesville. The town was occupied for three days before they marched towards the final siege of Richmond, the Confederate capital, which fell a few weeks later. Despite having burned the Virginia Military Institute, Custer ordered the University of Virginia not to be harmed out of respect for Thomas Jefferson. The March 1865 occupation of Charlottesville marks the beginning of liberation for the then approximately 14,000 African Americans who were being held in slavery in central Virginia. 
Beginning in 2017, the Charlottesville City Council decreed March 3rd as an annual commemoration of the liberation and freedom of the enslaved population of the city and county, who in 1865 were then a 52% majority of residents. In the first federal census of 1790, there were 12,585 people in Albemarle County, 6,835 whites, and 5,750 African Americans, 171 of whom were not enslaved. Ten years later, in the census of 1800, the population had increased to 16,439, 45% of whom were African American, 207 of whom were free. During the next seven decades, from 1800 to 1870, the county population, compared to growth of the nation as a whole, remained stable, always growing, but only barely. From 1810 to 1880, African Americans were consistently in the majority, though only slightly. In the 1860 census, there were nearly 27,000 people living in Albemarle County, 52% of whom were enslaved people of color. Just over 600 were listed as free. The university at the time had 13 professors and about 600 students. Here is the first graduating class of the Jefferson School, 1867. With support from the New England Freedmen's Aid Society, Nantucket abolitionist and educator Anna Gardner, seated in the front row center, came to Charlottesville in 1865 after the war to establish the first integrated school, which she named for Thomas Jefferson. That was a full five years before Virginia launched a statewide public school system in 1870. The Jefferson School of Charlottesville, which also trained future teachers, Isabella Gibbons having been the first, was held in a rundown former hotel and Confederate hospital on West Main Street, the Delavan Building, which later became the site of the First Baptist Church near Union Station. Written on the walls of every classroom were the words, Knowledge is Power. The Jefferson School was formally adopted into the Albemarle County public school system as a segregated school for children of color in 1871. A new Jefferson graded school building was erected at the corner of 4th and Commerce Streets in 1894, shown here. It was a new home for the segregated public school for children of color. It was strategically sited between two predominantly African-American neighborhoods, Star Hill and Vinegar Hill. By design, the school stopped at the eighth grade. Students interested in pursuing their education into high school and beyond had no option but to go to schools outside the area or even outside the state. It was not until February 1926, thanks to lobbying by parents, community, and church leaders, that Charlottesville opened an additional Jefferson School campus nearby this building that included a high school curriculum for African-American students. The 1894 school in this photo was torn down in 1960, but that 1926 school building has been preserved and today houses Charlottesville's African-American Heritage Center. The first known photographs of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello were taken by Charlottesville photographer William Rhodes in the winter of 1867-68. This image of the East Front captures the home in its near abandoned condition following the Civil War, during which time it was seized by the Confederate government. Monticello had been sold in 1827 by Jefferson's daughter Martha. In 1834, naval officer Uriah P. Levy purchased the property, though he was not often in residence there. Confederates seized the property from Levy, but in 1879, following years of extensive court battles, Monticello was returned to the ownership of his nephew, Jefferson Monroe Levy. In 1923, Jefferson Monroe Levy, who had served as a U.S. congressman in the early 1900s, agreed to sell Monticello for $500,000 to the newly founded Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation. The following year, the foundation opened the home to the public for the first time 
as a memorial to Thomas Jefferson and his ideals. The foundation continues to own and operate the estate today. Ormondo Gray's 1877 new map of Charlottesville and surrounding properties in Albemarle County was first published in his 1878 Atlas of the United States. About 30,000 people lived in the county in this period, which included roughly 2,800 people on 170 acres in the town of Charlottesville, the majority of whom were African American. After the town of Charlottesville was founded in 1762, a modest wood-framed courthouse was built on this site. It was later replaced in 1803 by a two-story brick structure that still forms the northernmost or rear portion of the courthouse. The statue honoring deceased Confederate soldiers was installed in front of the courthouse in May 1909. A decorative fountain for horses is visible on the right. Here is an incredibly rare turn of the 20th century photograph of a court day in Charlottesville. Historic Pleasant Green in Crozet, Virginia. According to county historic records, the original log cabin portion of this home was built around 1815 Jeremiah Wayland purchased the property and expanded the house in 1832. Claudius Crozet took room and board at Pleasant Green in 1849 when he surveyed the area for the construction of the Greenwood and Blue Ridge Railroad tunnels. After a rail stop was established just steps away from the front door in 1876, this home operated as a popular tourist destination for travelers seeking respite in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The rail stop was named Four Crozet, and the town that grew up around it took that name as well. Pleasant Green was once the center of community social life in western Albemarle County, which in the late 19th and first part of the 20th centuries was one of the most robust fruit-growing regions in the country. Pleasant Green stands today as the oldest surviving residential structure in the area, though at the time of this writing it is slated for demolition to make way for the construction of new homes. An area east of the town of Charlottesville, where Moores Creek runs into the Ravana River, had originally been referred to as Piraeus, after the historic main port of Athens, Greece. This was the industrial hub of the region throughout the 19th century. Since the late 1700s, this area had been the home of various milling operations, wool, flour, lumber known collectively as the Charlottesville Manufacturing Company. The railroad bridge and those buildings were burned when Union troops marched on Charlottesville in 1865. Following the Civil War, Henry Clay Marchant reopened the site as the Charlottesville Woolen Mills, which produced some of the most sought after woolen fabric in the entire country, used in everything from Brooks Brothers suits to postal and police officer uniforms. An entire community took shape around the mill, serving the employees with their own store, school, and chapel. After World War II, when synthetic fabrics and polyesters gained popularity, the Charlottesville Woolen Mills lost much of its market share. It closed down on Friday, October 31, 1962. Many of the original buildings have since been torn down. In early 2019, a $25 million renovation project was launched to turn the historic mill site into the new corporate campus of a high-tech firm. Charlottesville's Daily Progress newspaper began publication in 1892 out of this building on 5th Street, which has since been torn down. The town's first newspaper had been Clement McKinney's Central Gazette in 1820, which was followed by others throughout the 19th century. But the Progress has proven to be the longest running newspaper in the region and is still being published today. Charlottesville officially became an incorporated city with its own municipal government, taxing authority, and court system separate from Albemarle County by an act of the Virginia General Assembly on March 2, 1861. 
1888. After Charlottesville incorporated as a city in March of 1888, it set up a new city hall and police station here at 5th and Market Streets. City government was headquartered here until the late 1960s when it relocated to its current facility only a block away. This old city hall was torn down in 1968, as was the original city armory behind it. That entire block became the site of the new Market Street parking garage, though much of the original wall seen in this photo, along the sidewalk facing 5th Street, actually survives to this day. On Tuesday, June 14, 1887, a mule-drawn streetcar went into operation on Main Street in Charlottesville, connecting downtown to stops along West Main Street. An extra mule was needed to pull the car up Vinegar Hill, which was much steeper in those days. The mule would be unhitched at the top of the hill and would walk itself back down and wait for the next car. The streetcars were electrified in 1893, and by 1912, the tracks were extended west to the University of Virginia, and that despite opposition on the part of students who had argued that the five-cent rides were not a modern convenience, but a tourist gimmick that would bring unwelcome locals into the university neighborhood. In 1914, shortly after Rugby Road was paved for the first time, the streetcar went all the way up to what is now Beta Bridge. That made it much easier to get out to the UVA football and baseball games at Lambeth Field, which had first opened in 1902 and unveiled its new concrete bleachers and colonnade in 1913. The electric streetcars were decommissioned in 1935 and replaced with buses. Here's a photograph from the UVA corner about 1898. The building at the extreme right, which was the university bookstore and post office, is now the site of an entrance gateway on Hospital Drive. The 1890 Anderson Brothers bookstore building in the middle of the photograph is now the site of a CVS. The wood-framed building on the left was replaced by a larger brick structure in 1925 first home to Dr. Shep's University Drugstore, later the University Market, and since the summer of 1976, it's been the home of Little John's Deli. Known as the Bridge of Scores among UVA students at the time, this railroad trestle was built in 1901 near the entrance to the university grounds at the UVA corner. Originally a graded crossing since the tracks were laid in the late 1840s, the road was dug out beneath the railroad tracks to separate increasing street traffic from the dozens of passenger trains and freight trains that passed through the town each day. University students wasted no time adorning the new bridge with the scores of memorable football games. By the time this photo was taken in 1906, 27 victorious games had been memorialized on the bridge and at least another six on the concrete support wall. While the road was dug out deep enough to accommodate the height of the electric streetcars, it was unfortunately not enough clearance for the big trucks that would one day come along. And to this day, unsuspecting drivers continue to slam trucks into this railroad trestle, leading locals to now know it as the Truck Eating Bridge. Photographer Rufus Holsinger captured this now iconic image of the burning of the University of Virginia Rotunda, October 27, 1895. On that Sunday morning, thousands of people came running from their homes and church services to watch the fire. No one was killed in the blaze, the result of a faulty electrical wiring which had only recently been installed. The Rotunda and its 1853 North Annex were completely destroyed. Faculty, students, and townspeople risked their lives to save furniture, school supplies, and the thousands of books in the university library. Eyewitness reports say the dome crashed in about noon. Famed architect Stanford White led an effort to rebuild Jefferson's Rotunda, which included some of his own design ideas for much of the interior. White also designed three new classroom buildings as well, 
which were erected opposite the rotunda at the foot of the lawn, despite the fact that Jefferson had wished that view to remain open. The open view to the south, he'd once written, will be symbolic of the limitless freedom of the human mind. The Charlottesville Canning Company opened for business in the summer of 1905, manufacturing canned fruits and vegetables for what was then a fast emerging national market for such products. With an abundance of nearby farms producing the needed materials, a surplus of labor, and at the hub of an established east-west, north-south rail network, Charlottesville was an ideal location for such a venture. The canning company was recognized at the time as a symbol of Charlottesville's emergence as an industrial manufacturing community. Despite the failure of the canning company, it shuttered its doors within a few years, the next few decades saw an increasing number of successful manufacturing and light industry enterprises in Charlottesville and Albemarle. From the nationally recognized woolen mills along the Ravana River, to the Frank Ix and Sons Silk Mill, to Morton's Frozen Foods in Crozet. Though the building in this photograph has since been torn down, thanks to research by historical archeologist Steve Thompson, we know that it used to stand in what is now the parking lot for Southern States on Harris Street. Celebrated educator, mentor, and community leader Benjamin Tonsler is remembered as one of the most influential and inspiring men of his age. Born in 1854 in Albemarle County, he graduated from Hampton University, then returned to teach at the Jefferson Graded School in Charlottesville. He was principal of the school from 1895 until 1917, when he died after a short illness. He is pictured here with some students about 1910. Tonsler Park on Cherry Avenue in Fifeville is named in his memory. One of the earliest, though short-lived, theater and live music venues in Charlottesville, the Jefferson Opera House and Auditorium, opened at 6th and West Main on September 16, 1896, but succumbed to a tragic fire on November 28, 1907. This site is today a parking lot and the Shenanigans Toy Store on West Main Street. James Ronaldo Cox purchased this home at 611 East Main Street in the 1880s. It was here that he launched his poster and sign company. His nephew, William Jackson, eventually took over the business. Jackson was the son of Ronaldo's sister, beloved Jefferson School educator, Nanny Cox Jackson. With countless billboards, the Jackson Poster Company enjoyed tremendous success across multiple generations. At one time, it was one of only two outdoor sign companies in America that was owned by African Americans. This family home was torn down in the late 1960s and is now the site of Charlottesville City Hall. Textiles, lumber, quarrying, even a pencil factory all proved to be important sectors in the regional economy throughout much of the 20th century, just as the viability of farming was on the decline. Like much of the rest of the country, most of the manufacturing and industrial jobs were lost to automation or the allure of less expensive labor elsewhere. Most of Central Virginia's factories began to close in the 1960s and 70s, though a handful of successful companies still prosper in these sectors in the region to this day. The Ix and Sons textile mill was open from 1928 until 1999 and was among the largest employers in the region. Since the demise of large-scale manufacturing, many other successful entrepreneurial efforts have been based in Central Virginia, including Macmillan Publishing Services, Crutchfield, State Farm, Klockner, the CFA Institute, as well as a growing number of high-tech and biomedical enterprises. For over a century, the John Ferris Bell Funeral Home has served the Charlottesville region, now the oldest African-American-owned business of its kind in Central Virginia. Bell was born in Petersburg in 1890. After graduating from Hampton University and studying in Chicago, he founded his business in Charlottesville in 1917. He was later joined by his three sons, John, Henry, and Raymond. 
Henry's daughter, Deborah Bell Burks, and her husband, Martin Burks III, are now engaged in running the business. This is an image of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway Depot in downtown Charlottesville in 1905. Passenger rail service first came through Charlottesville in 1848 with the Louisa Railroad, which became the Central Virginia Railroad in 1850, and the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway in 1869, which linked the Chesapeake Bay to the Ohio River. The CNO unveiled this all-new Charlottesville Depot on Water Street in 1905, replacing a smaller 1883 wood-framed building. The horse, carriage, and the people were later painted into this picture when it was used for a postcard. The CNO ceased its passenger service when Amtrak was formed in 1971. Charlottesville CNO Depot closed in 1982, and in 1990, developers converted the building into office space. The first two lane Belmont Bridge, built in 1905, is visible in the far left of this image. A new four-lane highway-styled bridge was completed in 1961. The Albemarle County Courthouse was shared as a place of worship by various Christian denominations for many decades. The first church building, erected in Charlottesville, shown here, was Christ Episcopal Church at Jefferson and 2nd Streets Northwest, which was built 1825-26. It was raised in 1895 to make way for the Gothic-styled stone church that still stands on the same site today. Formed by African-American members of the then-segregated First Baptist Church of Charlottesville beginning in 1863, Charlottesville's First Baptist Church, initially called the Charlottesville African Church, began holding its own services in the basement of an old hotel on West Main Street just after the Civil War. Their present church building was dedicated on that same site in 1883 and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Albemarle County enjoys a rich Jewish tradition dating to the mid-18th century. Jews have been instrumental leaders in the social, commercial, political, and religious life of this region. On October 5, 1882, Congregation Beth Israel, formerly the Hebrew Benevolent Society, laid the cornerstone of the region's first synagogue located in downtown Charlottesville at the northwest corner of Church, now 2nd, and Market Streets. It was dedicated on June 8, 1883. That temple would still likely be standing in the same spot today, if not for the fact that in 1902, the federal government bought the site for a new post office and courthouse, which opened there in 1906, and is today the home of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library on Market Street. Congregation Beth Israel's members painstakingly erected a new home, shown in this photo, only a few blocks to the north at Jefferson and Third Streets, reusing much of the materials from the original temple. Dedicated on February 9, 1904, it survives today as the heart of the thriving and inspiring Jewish community of Central Virginia. The 1906 Federal Building, previously the site of the original congregation Beth Israel, it's at the northeast corner of 2nd and Market Streets, now the home of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library. Expanded in 1936, this building was long home to the U.S. Post Office on the main floor and the Federal Courthouse on the second. In the distant left in the photo is the 1905 First Baptist Church at the northeast corner of 2nd and Jefferson Streets, which burned down in February of 1977 and is now the site of the Queen Charlotte condominiums. The L-shaped home behind the federal building facing the church was built in 1821 and was for many years the home of Charlottesville businessman and postmaster Twyman Waite. The home was later occupied by Dr. Wilson Carey Nicholas Randolph and his wife Mary McIntyre Randolph. Following their deaths, the home went to Mary's brother Paul McIntyre. He in turn gifted that corner of land to the city of Charlottesville 
for a public library, which opened in a new building there in 1921 and is now the home of the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Foundation and Museum. This is a photograph of Charlottesville's Main Street and the Jefferson Theater in 1936. Built in 1901 as the Jefferson National Bank on East Main Street, today's downtown mall, the Jefferson was enlarged and converted into a theater in 1912. A combination silent movie house and vaudeville stage, the Jefferson was host to a number of popular films and performers over many years, including magician Harry Houdini. Other downtown movie theaters followed. The Lafayette in 1921, which is now the site of York Place shops and apartments. The Paramount Theater in 1931. The Vinegar Hill Theater in 1976. And the University Theater at the Corner was opened from 1938 to 1990. After struggling under various names for many years as a second-run movie theater, the Jefferson was sold to music promoter Corin Capshaw in 2006, who launched a multi-million dollar renovation project and has since reopened the historic venue as a live music hall. The marquee in this photo advertises the 1936 release The Trail of the Lonesome Pine, starring Fred McMurray and Henry Fonda, one of Hollywood's first successful color films. Rufus Holsinger took this photo of Midway, looking east on March 7, 1917. This part of town at the crest of Vinegar Hill along the historic Three Notched Road, later West Main Street, was known throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries as Midway, or sometimes Midway Square, or Midway Park. This photo was taken two years before the Lewis, Clark, and Sacagawea statue was unveiled. The 1894 Midway School is at the center, built on the site of the historic 1818 Midway Hotel. This school served the city's white children, elementary through high school, while African-American children attended the nearby Jefferson School. A new McGuffey graded school opened in 1916, and the Midway School thereafter became more commonly known as Lane High School, after teacher and school superintendent James Waller Lane. That school was that school was in turn replaced by the more modern Lane High School down the hill, which is today's county office building, which opened in 1940 and was not replaced by today's Charlottesville High School until 1974. The 1894 Midway School building in this photo later became municipal office space until 1966. The building was finally torn down in 1973 and in 1977, became the site of the Midway Manor Senior Housing Complex. The McGuffey Primary School opened in 1916 for white elementary school children. It is today the home of the McGuffey Arts Center. This is the Jefferson School's sixth grade class of 1929 with their teacher, Rebecca McGinnis, standing in the back. Mrs. McGinnis was born in Charlottesville in 1892. Educated at Hampton University, she taught at the Jefferson School from 1915 until her retirement in 1960. She lived another 40 years after that, passing away in 2000 at age 107. She is remembered fondly by generations of students and friends. Opened as the Janie Porter Barrett Day Nursery in 1935, the Barrett Early Learning Center is now recognized as the oldest pre-K school of its kind in the state of Virginia. It has been located in a historic home on Ridge Street since 1958. A photograph of nurses with the University of Virginia's 8th Evacuation Hospital Unit, which served during World War II from 1942 to 1945 in both Northern Africa and Italy. The 8th EVAC received numerous awards and commendations for its service and served in the war longer than any other American hospital-affiliated medical unit. During their time on active duty, the doctors and nurses from UVA cared for over 48,000 patients 
plus over 53,000 outpatients. And remarkably, despite being on the front lines in battle in the Italian mountains, only 253 of those patients in their care passed away, less than one half of 1%. Charlottesville's thriving Greek community broke ground on Central Virginia's first Greek Orthodox Church on Tuesday afternoon, August 25th, 1953, exactly 50 years since Nicholas Vell of Sparta had made Charlottesville his home. Known as the ambassador of the local Greek community, Vell helped to establish numerous immigrants and Greek families in the Charlottesville area. They were inspiring leaders in the business and civic life of the region and continue to be so into the 21st century. Their historic church at Perry and McIntyre Roads is still the heart of Charlotte Hill's Greek community to this day. Celebrated award-winning Charlotte Hill photographer and University of Virginia alumnus Edwin Flash Roseberry captured this classic image of shops along the UVA corner in November of 1950 with his new 4x5 pacemaker speed graphic camera. Mincer's Humidor had first opened in a cramped space off an alley at the UVA corner in July of 1948. In the summer of 1954, the pipe shop relocated up the street to this much larger space where it continues to this very day. The pipes and tobacco gradually gave way to t-shirts and sportswear. Here's a 1952 photograph of Inge's store at 333 West Main Street, the heart of the once thriving Vinegar Hill community. This building was fortunately spared when most of the area was raised in the early 1960s as part of urban renewal. It has been the site of various restaurants since the market closed in 1979. To the left is the model steam laundry cleaners, which was in business there for many decades. After graduating from the Hampton Institute, George P. Inge came to Charlottesville to teach in the public school system. In 1891, at age 28, he began a business career as the owner-operator of Inge's Grocery, which was continued by his son Thomas Inge Sr. until 1979. The Inge family of nine children, among whom there were four teachers, two medical doctors, a college professor, and two businessmen, originally lived upstairs of this grocery. Mr. George Inge was active in civic, social, educational, and religious affairs in the community. At one time, he served as chairman of the local Republican Party. Public hotels refused to accommodate black visitors, and private homes had to fill in this void. The Inge family often had famous black guests staying at their home, including Booker T. Washington, who was a classmate of Inge at Hampton Institute. Following an educational program for children of color advocated by Booker T. Washington, emphasizing vocational skills, industrial training, and domestic science, the Albemarle Training Academy opened on Hydraulic Road in the 1890s. Its longtime teacher and principal, Mary Carr Greer, had been born and raised nearby and continued to live on the family's Riverview Farm, now the Ivy Creek Natural Area. Under Greer's leadership, the school transformed its curriculum to a modern four-year high school education. After the city and county opened Burley High on Rose Hill Drive for African-American students in 1951, the Albemarle Training School became an elementary school before finally closing in 1959. The intersection of Emmett Street and Barracks Road, a July 1948 aerial photograph by Ed Roseberry. A gas station turned roadhouse Carol's Tea Room was located here from 1937 to 1957, one of the most legendary night spots in UVA and Charlottesville history. It is now the site of a bank at the Barracks Road Shopping Center. 
and this once rural crossroads out in the country has become one of the busiest intersections in central Virginia. The Colonial Grocery Store was one of the first shops to open as part of the new Barracks Road Shopping Center, which celebrated its grand opening on Halloween weekend, 1959. The nearby Seven Day Shopping Center, or Meadowbrook, and the University Shopping Center on Ivy Road had both opened before Barracks, but the Barracks Road Shopping Center was the first large-scale suburban shopping experience of its kind in the Charlottesville area. A formidable expression of the car culture and suburban sprawl of the 1950s. Colonial is now the site of a Kroger grocery and ABC store, and the shopping center has since expanded to the north and the south. George R. Ferguson Jr. is remembered as one of the great civil rights leaders of Virginia in the 20th century. A former president of the local NAACP, he helped to lead the effort to desegregate the UVA hospital as well as public schools in central Virginia. Ferguson's father was the first established African-American physician in Albemarle County. Rather than follow his father into medicine, Mr. Ferguson pursued a career in the mortuary business, opening his own funeral home in Charlottesville in 1941 which he operated quite successfully for many decades until his passing in 1993. Photographer Russell Rip Payne captured this historic moment one afternoon as children left an integrated public school for the first time in Charlottesville. Like most of the former Confederate South in the wake of the May 17th 1954 Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, white leaders in Virginia pledged a protest of massive resistance against any effort to desegregate public schools. On September 19, 1958, rather than accept integration, Virginia Governor Lindsey Amon ordered the all-white public schools closed in select communities, which included the city of Charlottesville. The move attracted national press attention. It was not until September 8, 1959, owing to a court order that the schools were at last desegregated and children of color began to attend the formerly all-white schools in Charlottesville, nine at Venable Elementary and three at Lane High School, known collectively as the Charlottesville Twelve. This Ed Roseberry photograph looks south across the Belmont Bridge during the 1951 Apple Harvest Parade, an autumn tradition that had begun the year before and which became the Springtime Dogwood Festival in 1958. The bridge was built in 1905, connecting the east end of downtown Charlottesville over the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad tracks to the fast-growing Belmont neighborhood, a planned community named for the sprawling 550-plus acre Belmont estate that had occupied the area throughout the 19th century. In 1891, developers with the Belmont Land Company began selling parcels in the area for home sites and businesses. In 1961, a new four-lane highway bridge was installed to replace the original, and a third iteration of the Belmont Bridge is now being planned. Charlottesville's Apple Harvest Festival Parade on Main Street, downtown, in October of 1953. The annual festival had been launched in 1950, complete with a parade and fair to celebrate one of the region's most historic and successful agricultural industries. Throughout much of the 1800s, Central Virginia's Albemarle Pippin was among the most popular varieties of apple in America and in England. This Saturday, October 3, 1953, Harvest Festival Parade enjoyed spectacular weather in Charlottesville. The photo was taken just before the parade began, looking east down Main Street, today's downtown mall. Sears and Leggett's department stores are on the right, 
later the site of a Regal Cinema in 1996. In the next block on the right is the 1921 Lafayette Movie Theater, which in 1960 became the site of a Rose's department store, and in 1996, the York Place Shops and Apartments. The 1920 National Bank Building, Charlottesville's first skyscraper, is visible on the left. The annual community celebration was reorganized as the Dogwood Festival and moved to the spring beginning in April of 1958. Randolph Lewis White launched the Charlottesville Albemarle Tribune weekly newspaper in October 1954, offering a more honest, balanced, and thoughtful account of African Americans throughout Central Virginia. The paper was a welcome source of local news and events in the black community. The paper was an important and influential voice throughout the Civil Rights Movement. White led the paper until his passing at age 95 in 1991. Beginning the following year, the paper continued to be published under the name The Tribune until 2011. Born and raised in the Fifeville neighborhood of Charlottesville, Elmer Sonny Sampson was for many years the beloved band director at Jackson P. Burley High School. Opened in 1951, the school was operated jointly by Albemarle County and the city of Charlottesville to educate African-American students grades 8 through 12. It became a middle school for Albemarle County in 1973. Mr. Sampson was an inspiring mentor to generations of children. The musicians he taught and led created one of the most impressive and sought after high school bands in Virginia. In this photo, the Burley High School Band marches in the 1963 Cherry Blossom Parade in Washington, D.C. Scenes from the classic 1956 movie Giant were filmed in the Keswick area of Albemarle County in the summer of 1955. Photographer Ed Roseberry took this photo in the Terrace Room, a private upstairs dining room of the Thomas Jefferson Inn on Emmett Street, where the stars and some crew were staying. The inn had first opened in May of 1951, closed in 1968, and is now the Federal Executive Institute. Having snuck in through the kitchen, Roseberry obviously surprised some of the famous cast members as they were eating. On the far left is actor Paul Fix. In the middle is Rod Taylor. A 30-year-old Rock Hudson looks over his left shoulder, and next to him is 23-year-old Elizabeth Taylor. The movie also starred James Dean, though he did not appear in these scenes filmed in Virginia. Unfortunately, Giant was to be Dean's last movie, as he died in a tragic car accident on September 30th, 1955 in California, over a year before the film's premiere. The movie was nominated for 10 Academy Awards and director George Stevens won the Oscar for Best Director. The University Movie Theater, June 1949. Photograph by Ed Flash Roseberry. The University Theater opened at 1325 West Main Street near the UVA corner on Friday night, September 30th, 1938, and didn't close until the summer of 1990, when the facility was converted into shops and apartments. The movie marquee in this photo reads Arthur and McRae, The More the Merrier, a 1943 comedy starring Gene Arthur and Joel McRae. Beyond the theater, you can also see Amico and Esso gas stations as well as signs for Bradley Payton's Pontiac Cadillac dealership, all of which were later torn down to make way for a Howard Johnson's Motor Lodge, which opened in April 1967 and in the summer of 1996 became a Red Roof Inn and is now the Graduate Hotel. The first organized civil rights march at the University of Virginia was held at the UVA corner in late March 1961. Led by Virginius Thornton, the first African-American graduate student in the College of Arts and Sciences, the three-day march protested the University Movie Theater's segregationist policy. Thornton was joined by students both black and white, as well as members of the faculty. 
Gregory Swanson, at the center in this photograph, won a landmark court ruling on September 5, 1950, when a three-judge circuit court panel ordered the University of Virginia to admit him to the law school. That fall, Swanson became the first person of color to ever attend any school at UVA. Swanson's case was heard in what was then the federal courtroom for Charlottesville, now the second floor McIntyre room in the public library on Market Street. This celebratory photo was taken just across the street in Lee Park, now Market Street Park, only moments after the ruling and only steps away from a 1924 statue that celebrated the leadership of Robert E. Lee and the lost cause of the U.S. Confederacy. From left to right in the photo, Dr. Jesse Tensley, Martin A. Martin, Spotswood Robinson III, Gregory Swanson, Oliver W. Hill, Thurgood Marshall, Hale Thompson, and Robert Cooley. A native of Charlottesville, Edward Jackson was a veteran of World War II, a land developer, and he helped to run the family's very successful Jackson Poster advertising business. He is perhaps best known for having founded, built, and operated the Brenwana Motel, Restaurant, and Nightclub, just south of town on Route 29, seen here at its opening in July of 1958. Named for his two daughters, Brenwana was created to serve African American travelers who struggled to find decent places to stop, rest, and eat in the segregated South. It was included in the Negro Motorist Green Book Travel Guide, which was published from 1936 to 1966. According to Mr. Jackson's family, Brenwana was in practice always integrated, the first of its kind in Central Virginia. Dr. Martin Luther King dined here when he spoke at UVA in 1963. Brenwana didn't close until 1979, though Jackson didn't sell the property until the early 1990s. The nightclub was an incredibly popular live music venue throughout the 1960s and 70s. Downtown Charlottesville, Main Street, May of 1960. One of Charlottesville's most legendary eateries, John Tuck's Gaslight Restaurant, was a unique and popular destination in Charlottesville throughout the 1960s and 70s. Open to rave reviews in 1961, the Gaslight was located on West Main Street, adjacent and to the east of the historic Hotel Albemarle, which had been built as the Gleason Hotel in 1896. Gaslight's fans have remembered the place as a steakhouse, beer hall, oyster bar, pop art museum, jazz joint, and folk singer's coffee house, all wrapped up in one. Bob Dylan and Joan Baez both performed live at the Gaslight, and Simon and Garfunkel were said to eat there when they were in town. So did Muhammad Ali. In 1970, Tuck moved the Gaslight to a spot by the fountain at Barracks Road Shopping Center. And then later, in 1982, he returned the gaslight to West Main Street near its original location. Following Tuck's untimely passing, the gaslight lost its luster and eventually closed, marking the end of an era in Charlottesville. The first gaslight building was torn down in 1979 and 80 and is now a parking lot but the adjacent historic Hotel Albemarle still stands, now home to offices and shops, and has since been painted a bright yellow. From the Rip Payne collection of historic photographs, here's a 1967, possibly 68 image of people lining up to get into the Paramount Theater downtown. The marquee reads Sandy Dennis, the Fox in color. In these pre-Stonewall years, when the Hollywood censorship code was only just beginning to give way, throngs of people turned out all around the country to see this, one of the first ever wide-release films to deal openly with lesbian love, and even included an on-screen kiss. The line literally stretched down Main Street 
and then up third. Spectators gather at 2nd and East Main Streets for the July 1962 parade to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the founding of Charlottesville. The route of the parade traveled east on Main Street before turning north towards Market Street. The event was held at 5 p.m. on Monday evening, July 16, 1962. The theme of the parade was Let Freedom Ring, and the Daily Progress described it as 200 years of Charlottesville history tied up in a bright colored bundle. The 1931 Paramount Theater is visible in the background, as is the 1956 Miller and Rhodes Department Store. The two buildings to the left of the Paramount Theater were destroyed by fire in August 1973, and the resulting empty lot was incorporated into a design for the 1976 Downtown Pedestrian Mall, and is now the site of the Central Place Fountain. An early 1960s aerial of the section of downtown Charlottesville long referred to as Vinegar Hill, so named by Irish immigrants in the mid-19th century who lived here and who'd come to the region as part of an effort to construct the rail lines across Virginia. By the mid-20th century, this part of town had become the center for African-American life in the city. Regrettably, most of the buildings here were raised from 1962 to 65 as part of an urban renewal program, and many of the residents were moved into federally subsidized public housing. Advocates of the demolition of this entire neighborhood had hoped that the cleared land would become home to new office buildings, but the land remained an undeveloped dirt field for decades. Though there has been some development in this area, arguably most of this land is now used as parking lots. Buddy Glover's Restaurant on Emmett Street near the University. It was the site of an historic civil rights demonstration in May 1963. Protesters, both black and white, were beaten in the street by four local white men. Those attacked included a white University of Virginia professor, Paul Gaston, and local NAACP leader, Reverend Henry Floyd Johnson. As Gaston remembers, the violence helped to galvanize most of the Charlottesville community to finally embrace efforts at desegregating local businesses. In spite of the violence that took place that day, Gaston remembers the event as a positive turning point in Charlottesville's history. Buddy Glover, on the other hand, rather than integrate his restaurant, closed down in protest. The building has since been torn down. Photographer Ed Roseberry took this photograph of Main Street, downtown Charlottesville, in April 1971, just a few years before construction of the downtown mall. Following years of planning and debate, not to mention a notable lawsuit in opposition, Charlottesville's downtown Main Street was converted to a pedestrian mall in 1976. This Ed Roseberry photo was taken that spring, a few months before the grand opening ceremony on July 4th. This image looks west, down the mall from 5th Street, near the Nook Restaurant. This was prior to construction of the new federal building and hotel on Vinegar Hill, so one could see all the way to the historic 1926 Jefferson School building, the steeple of the 1883 First Baptist Church on West Main Street, and beyond that on the horizon, the 1912 John Watts Kearney House, Antiora, on Lewis Mountain. Also visible on the south side of the mall, on the left, is the Standard Drug Company, now a CVS, Woolworths, which closed on October 21, 1997, after 75 years and was redeveloped as the Terraces Complex by Oliver Kuttner. You can also see Roses, which opened in 1960 on the site of the 1921 Lafayette Movie Theater. Roses was later developed as York Place, which opened in the fall of 1995 by entrepreneur Chuck Lewis. 
Designed by famed landscape architect Lawrence Halperin, Charlottesville's downtown mall is recognized today as one of the most successful projects of its kind in the entire country. Photographer Ed Roseberry captured this photograph of the University of Virginia Easter's party on Sunday afternoon, April 11, 1976, when an estimated 15,000 people piled into Mad Bowl near the fraternity houses. UVA's Easter's has been called the biggest college party in America in the 20th century. The springtime tradition had its origins as a formal evening of dancing in the late 1880s. Over the course of the ensuing decades, Easter's evolved into a multi-day series of parties, dances, and music concerts that drew an increasing number of young people from up and down the East Coast. Owing to safety concerns and the changing times, the university canceled Easter's altogether in 1982. The Ridge Drive-In Movie Theater opened on Saturday night, April 22, 1950, and didn't close until 1979. It was located at Route 29 and Hydraulic Roads, and is today the site of a Kroger grocery and ABC store. Drury John Burchard Brown was a legendary figure in the struggle for racial justice in Central Virginia. As a young man, Mr. Brown had lived a rough and tumble life on the streets of Charlottesville and had suffered under the oppressions of Jim Crow. He served valiantly in World War II, then went on to become a pioneering leader in local politics. He was a peerless community organizer in support of employment for African Americans all across the region. He helped to found the Monticello Area Community Action Agency and was one of Virginia's most significant and effective civil rights leaders. After his passing, the city of Charlottesville named the bridge on West Main Street for him and has continued to honor other bridge builders who have followed in his footsteps, building bridges between races, classes, and neighborhoods. An aerial photograph by photojournalist Rip Payne, circa 1970, of the construction of the Route 29-250 bypass intersection with the new Interstate Highway 64, an area now known as Exit 118B. That's the future I-64 at the bottom of the image being cut through the trees to the west, left, and to the east on the right, plus Route 29-250 going north-south. The proposed route of I-64 across Virginia had proven to be quite controversial for many years. At one time, it looked like the preferred route would go from Richmond west to Lynchburg, then through the Blue Ridge to Roanoke. There was even an organized group in Albemarle County who did their very best to fight it, saying it would hurt property values and make the countryside ugly. But the pro-Charlottesville interests won that battle and I-64 came through town in the early 1970s before continuing west across the Blue Ridge at Afton. Dave Matthews Band's first big gig. It was on Sunday, April 5th, 1992, and the local Dave Matthews Band, which had formed only the year before, took to the stage at the annual outdoor Van Riper's Music Festival in Afton, Virginia. At the beginning of their set, Matthews nervously approached the microphone and said, Hello, we're the Dave Matthews Band. This is definitely the biggest bunch of people we ever collectively stood up in front of, so we're a little excited on such a nice day. Very nice to meet y'all. Just a few months before, in February of that year, the alternative weekly newspaper, Seville Weekly, had prophetically asked on its cover, is the Dave Matthews Band the next big thing? The rest, as they say, is history. An image from West Main Street near the Junction, or the Union Depot, where the CNO tracks cross the Norfolk and Southern Line. The streetcar is visible in the distance and beyond that, the steeple of the First Baptist Church.
Never in our history has there been such a boom in real estate. Soon we will indeed be a city. Where can investors and those seeking homes find better soil, purer air, better society, and educational advantages and a lovelier country than Charlottesville and its vicinity affords? H.B. Mickey, editor of the Charlottesville Chronicle, June 24th, 1887.